All right. Hello, everybody. So good to see you. God bless you and welcome to a new year. Happy New Year, family. Hello and welcome to Flight 2021. As we prepare to take off into the new year, please make sure your attitude and blessings are secured and locked in an upright position. All self-destructive voices should be turned off at this time. All negativity, hurt, and discouragement should be put away. Should we lose attitude or cabin pressure during the flight, reach up and pull down a prayer. Prayers will automatically be activated by faith. All right, everybody. So good to see you. God bless you. And we're just delighted uh, that, that we are here together today again. And I'm so glad to see you again. I've missed you. I've been away for a few weeks. Uh, but I'm delighted to be back. And so we're here to begin a brand new brand new study on the book of Isaiah as we begin the new year, Comfort My People. And so uh, just if you're brand new to, to us, if you're brand new to this study, I want to encourage you that everything is available for you online and you can find our daily readings located at this website, SabbathSchoolPersonalMinistries.org. Uh, and there you can find the lesson. In fact, you can find the lessons for every person in your family according to their age and the adult lesson which is the one we discuss here it's available at this site and so we'll love to have you participate and remember that you can send your the answers to our questions and you can share right in the chat right there where you're watching we love to hear your sharing your answer we, we especially ask for for you to share your stories just uh the the stuff that's happened or is happening in your life we'd love to hear your stories so please share with us. And by the way, we're going to be covering the book of Isaiah for the entire first three months of this new year, 2021. So if you would like to be a part of our study, if you're, if you're following the study, um, and, so if, and if you want to be a part of this, of this panel, if you'd like to join us one week, please send us an email. We'd love to have you. Just send us an email right here to communications at seabrooksda.org. And, uh, and we'll arrange for a time for you to join us here because we are just delighted to have you. Today, as I like to do typically from week to week, I like to begin with, with gratitude. And that is how we're going to introduce our panelists here for today. And I know that the year that just ended it was very difficult, very difficult for all of us. And for some people, more difficult than for others. Uh, and today, we're going to nonetheless focus on gratitude. So this morning here, just uh, to introduce uh, our, our time together, I want to give thanks to God for my Seabrook family. I want to give thanks to God for you. I want to give thanks to God for this ministry that has continued to be strong, even though we had to go online since March of 2020. But God blessed us. We baptized people. We held communion. We did weddings. Um, we did baby dedications. We served many people. We distributed goods to the community. We walked in the community. We marched for justice. So 2020, a difficult year, and yet a year uh, where God was with us. And I'd like you to uh, meet now the folks who are joining us today for our panel. And here is Brother Thomas. Gerald Thomas, welcome. So good to have you, Brother Thomas. And what are you going to share here this morning as we open? Excuse me, I didn't hear you. Oh, so we're just uh, now just doing the introduction. And so what are you grateful for from the difficult year 2020 that just ended? Well, I'm thankful that the Lord kept me through the whole year. I'm grateful that I had food, clothing, and shelter. I'm thankful that I was in my right mind and that I didn't catch COVID-19, which a lot of people did, you know, and the Lord has been keeping me, even though I'm... A disabled veteran, I live alone, the Lord has continued to keep me. So mm. that's what I'm grateful for. And I'm glad to have you here this morning, Brother Thomas. And we have Helen Butami as well. And Helen, welcome to our panel here today. Well, thank you. So what's your gratitude? What, what, what would you like to share from, from uh, 2020? Yes, happy Sabbath, everybody. 2020, as I can describe it, it was a year of eye-opening, spiritual eyes 
opening the mutual years. So well, as for my family, we went through some hard time with my baby nephew that was born in the third. So by the grace of God and the love of God and the strength and the support, which I'm thankful for, for God to give me the opportunity to be of a great support to my family, especially the young couple who's my younger brother and a wife. Mm. All through five months till the baby, you know, God put him to sleep on Christmas Day. It was heartbreaking. However, just like how God gave it and God took it. So I was grateful that I did not lose my mind. And the parents they did not lose their mind. And God kept giving me the power and courage to encourage them throughout this process. So I'm grateful that God gave me a freedom. If I want to say something for gratitude, it's freedom. God gave me freedom of entitlement, freedom of attachment, mm -hmm. freedom of uncontrollable emotion. So I am grateful for that, mm -hmm. for the year 2020. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for sharing. And, and Helen, I noticed that uh, we're losing your connection a little bit. So... Uh, why don't we do this? Can you log off and come back and see if that improves the connection for us? Um, all right. So as we begin here our study today, and thank you everybody for sharing uh, your gratitude. Go ahead and share because doing that uh, is good for yourself and then it blesses someone else. Um, but let's go ahead and begin here this morning, everybody. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Brother Gerald, if you would lead us, that'd be wonderful. All righty. Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for this another blessed Sabbath day. We're thankful, Lord, for this opportunity to discuss as we begin a new quarter in the book of Isaiah, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with each and every participant on the panel. Continue to bless Pastor Munoz as he leads out. And we ask, oh Lord, your blessing on all those who are listening, that they may receive a blessing from what is discussed this day. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Thomas. So today we're beginning a three-month study of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, if you're brand new to the Bible, is located right in the middle of the book, basically. And it's an incredible book. It has 66 chapters. Just like the Bible has 66 books, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. The book of Isaiah has been called the first gospel. Uh, some call it the fifth gospel because in the gospel in the in the Old Testament it's just an incredible book that uh, paves the way for understanding the ministry of Jesus Christ and uh, the study for uh, the introductory study today is called crisis of identity and so let's get right into it so Isaiah was the son of Amos and was descended from royalty we learn he was called to be a prophet when he was young, uh, by the end of Uzziah's reign. This was one of the kings of Judah. And this was the year 790 to 739 before Christ. During the co-regency of Jothan, uh, which was the king in the north, in the northern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Israel. And now his ministry lasted for at least 60 years and covered the reigns of Uzziah, the one that was in power when he wrote this, and Jothan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now the book of Isaiah begins explaining the crisis of identity of God's people. It was a call to change and offer forgiveness from God. So let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, again, the, the whole study for the whole quarter is called Come For My People. And so here we go, Isaiah 1 and verse 3. And Helen, let's see how your sound is now. Can you read the, the scripture for us right on the screen? Okay. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master scrape, but Israel does not know my people. Do not consider. Mm, yes. Thank you so much. That's quite a scripture, isn't it? Uh, imagine, imagine that 
that message. Uh, animals know better than you do. That, <laughs> that for a preacher, for a prophet, that's a, that's a very difficult message to give. And so, Second uh, Kings chapters fifteen to twenty, and Second Chronicles twenty six to thirty two, the chapters they cover the time window during which Isaiah carried out his preaching, his ministry, his teaching, his exhorting. By the end of Uzziah's reign, God proclaimed something. And it was basically in verses 2 to 4, um, uh, that in this, uh, right here in Isaiah chapter 1, that Israel had forgotten who the Lord was. And they had lost their identity. If they forgot who God was, they forgot who they were as well. And so here, uh, I want to ask everybody a, a question. And uh, so, Helen, I want to ask you this question. Uh, Brother Thomas, I want to ask you this question. And you watching right there or listening, what do you say to this? Did you ever choose to forget that you are God's person? How did it go? And why did you come back to God? Who wants to go first? I can go first. Okay. All right, Helen. Go for it. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, 2019, I experienced what is called depression. I've only studied the word or watching videos for people facing depression. I didn't know it would happen to me also. Okay. Being that coming to America, we have our own perception of American dreams to make it big so your family can be proud of you or to support your family. But that wasn't it at the beginning. So I went to college and I was in and out in order to support my family. So it was taking too long for me. I said, no, I cannot keep up with this. So when I heard of a crash program somewhere, I said that would be the easier path for me. So I left college and I jumped in. When I went there, I went there with my heart and my body and my soul. I know that this is it. I'm, I'm going to make it. This is a life-changing opportunity. I wasn't praying enough. I didn't have enough connection. All is I want to make it. So I was there. I wasn't sleeping enough, even studying the Bible. After failing two classes, I was kicked out of that program that's when i faced the reality of my life disappointment set in bitterness set in i felt ashamed of myself i felt like i was a loser that cannot complete nothing this is america the land of opportunity what is wrong with me why can't i make it i couldn't finish my college degree yeah now i want to do a boycott the shorter road i was kicked out that's when i experienced depression i locked myself in the room for three good weeks it happens um april 2nd 2009 from that day i was in the room i wasn't going to work i was barely eating i drank water just used the bathroom I wasn't talking to nobody. I did not answer no calls. I did not call nobody. I was in the room lamenting, asking myself why, why me, why me? I wasn't even thinking of praying. Music that I love, singing that I love, it was like poison to me at that moment. So the only thing that came in my heart I told God, like, Father, right now, I don't know how to pray or what to ask of you. What I can ask you is just to guide my heart during this process. So I was in the room first week, second week till April ending, which leads to May. Being that May is my, my birth month, I have a little jump start. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, Helen. 
So I think I think I'm we're catching the uh, the the bulk of the story, although the sound is still a bit distorted. Um, all right, so I I I love to hear some more on that, Helen. Uh, let's yeah. let's go to Brother Thomas. Let's go to Brother Thomas and have him share uh, his answer to this question too. Okay, uh, when you mentioned Isaiah's ministry lasted sixty years, I thought about getting baptized by Pastor C. D. Brooks sixty years ago in Cleveland, mm -hmm. Ohio, and then uh, I went to church school from the seventh to the eleventh grade at the academy there. And then all of a sudden, I had a scholarship at college at seventeen, but I blew it. And then the army drafted me in nineteen sixty nine, and you know what? The Vietnam War was at its height. So I thought I was going to lose my life. I had no direction. When I went overseas, I was following the crowd. We were doing drugs. We were doing alcohol and everything. And I said, wait a minute, this is not me. So when I got back from overseas, I sent my wife and my little one-year-old daughter to come down to Texas with me. And then uh, two years later, we got rebaptized, me and her. And from then on, I was serving the Lord you know, teaching Sabbath school, personal ministries, and being a deacon, everything. You know, the Lord just blessed us. We were able to travel five times from Texas to Cleveland. We drove. We drove three times from Augusta, Georgia to Cleveland, and nothing. The Lord just kept us all the time. And I'm just so thankful that my three children, they, they were two, five, and 10 when I got out the army. Now they're 42, 45, and 50. So God, you know, I'm glad he brought me back. <laughs> and we're so glad. So glad he brought you back too, indeed. Thank you for sharing. You know, um, that leads us to the part of the study that is uh, that is that can be entitled A Form of Godliness. And... Um, and so this is this is what the Bible here touches on. So let's take a look at Isaiah chapter one and verse thirteen. Brother Thomas, can you read it right there from the screen for us? Okay. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is in an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Hmm. How about that? God says to people who are involved in church, people who are not missing a Sabbath, people who are going to church, I'm sick of your worship. I'm sick of your songs. I'm sick of your prayers. Wow, what's going on here? Um, so, of course, if you, if, you, if you read your Bible this week to follow along, you know exactly what it is. But if you didn't, please stick around. And if you did, stick around too, because we're going to go uh, a little bit deeper into this. Um, the question is, how could something that God had ordained, had ordained become sin or iniquity? Something good, worshiping God, praying, going to church, uh, even, even doing service. How, how could something good become something that God detests and does not want anymore from me? Well, they were offering sacrifices and praying to God with lifted hands, but they were only keeping up appearances. This is what we learn when we listen and read the message of Isaiah. Their hands, the Bible says, were blood-stained. Verse 16. Hmm, interesting. Because they were violent and unfair to people in need. Verse 17 in Isaiah chapter 1. Their rites or their worship services, their prayer, their praise songs were void of repentance. And God considered them sin because they were shallow. The people of God repeated the same mistakes several times. By the way, we could read about this for Jesus and encounter something similar. If you want to read about that, you can go to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 23, verses 23. 23 to 28 and find a similar complaint from Christ to the people to the people that he encountered. So we get to be aware of repeating the same mistakes ourselves. I definitely don't want to. And so with that, let's let's see what the appeal was. Uh, and uh, Helen, let's see if maybe your sound has improved uh, your computer connection. Can you go ahead and read this for us? Okay. 
Isaiah 1 verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. What is your favorite path of this call to action and why? Yes, thank you so much, Helen. Uh, that, sounded, that sounded great. So that was the appeal. Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Because they were praising, they were going to church, they were um, praying, you know, in our terms, you know, they, they, were, they were just doing everything. I mean, they were involved. These were people who weren't just attending church. They were involved. They were deacons and deaconesses and elders and pastors and pathfinders and you name it they were do they were involved in everything but then when it came to people in need oh you know they didn't have any time for that so uh what is what is my favorite part of this appeal um what does it say to you about god brother thomas you want to go on that one okay my favorite part is uh, defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. You know, uh, I lost my father in, when he was only 61, and my mother lived to be 86. She was a widow for 23 more years, and she died in 2006. But you know what? She had a few sons that could help her out, you know, and it was still not the same thing, you know. And I look at my brothers and sisters' children who are fatherless because of murder and death. You know, I lost four brothers and one sister. So the thing, well, two sisters, the only two sisters I had, but only one had a son. So the thing is, I looked out for these nephews and nieces, you know, through the years because I knew how it was. I was with my children. So it's a difference, you know. So I said, I, that's why I look at the fact to defend the fathers and plead for the widow because I've experienced that a lot in my life. And there are a lot of young people who don't have fathers out here in this world. And there are a lot of women that have to struggle by themselves to try to support their family. And it's really a struggle. So we need to look out and, you know, seek justice and rebuke the oppressor. And, you know, the Lord was not, he was not happy with the way they were doing. You know, a lot of people, if you look at the Jewish nation today, they still got these traditions, they still have these feasts and so forth. But they're not, you know, it's a lot of people that are poor and needy that they're not even thinking about, you know. They're millionaires and billionaires, but they need to look out for those who are fatherless and the widows. Mm, yes, thank you so much. You know, for me, when it comes to finding clarity, finding, really understanding, what is it that God is after? If, if it's not clear, if I don't, okay, what, what does God want from me? Ah, uh, then you think, well, but to, to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with, with your God, that's, that's exactly right straight out of the Bible. And then you go to passages like these in Isaiah, and there's so many, and, and in Christ who said, uh, there's going to be two kinds of people at the end of time. Those who are making the world a better place, uh, alleviating suffering, for I was hungry and you gave me food. Thirst and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I didn't. I was cold, naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and in prison. So, um, it's not. It's not hard to find out what it is that God wants from us. To love God and to love people, and that's what I love about these passages in Isaiah. Uh, and uh, because what we don't want to do is to do this. Uh, Joyce Hammond here quoting a scripture with the lips, you know, but their hearts are far from me. Um, so that is that is not the kind of life that we want to live. We want to live a life that reflects who God is. So thank you, thank you so much uh, for sharing on that. All right, so let's uh, let's move to the the next part of our study, which is the grace part, an offer of forgiveness. And here is actually, uh, we have here the, uh, the our memory verse uh, for this week, if you got to do this. And so 
Uh, here is one of the best scriptures in all of the Bible, most beloved uh, throughout the centuries. And it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. So, my friends, God wants to turn the violent red on the hands of the Israelites into His purity. God wants to forgive our sins and to purify our hearts. God asks us to just come to Him with the intention of settling accounts with Him. That is, with repentance. Our heart changes when we truly accept forgiveness and set about helping those in need. Once we acknowledge our need for forgiveness, we're ready to accept everything God has for us. So I have a question for you. Do you feel completely forgiven by God? Do you feel loved and fully accepted by God? And that question is for, is for everyone. Is that how you feel? And let me put it on the screen there for you. And so share in the chat. Love to hear your stories. And um, for this one, uh, Helen, did you want to share your forgiveness story? Yes, I want to. Great. God give me the strength to do it. But if you don't say it out, there will be no forgiveness and there will be no deliverance. So before joining the Adventist faith, you know, as a young girl, we used to, you know, watch pornography like for fun, you know. I just like, it's normal. We are young and we are hot. So I didn't put it into consideration like it's something that it might affect me later or something that will become a huge sin. So after I joined Adventist faith, started studying the Bible by myself, learned to have a personal relationship with God, that's when I learned that pornography is one of those sins that if you don't run away from it, it's going to eat you up. So I started wondering, I have, you know, I met Pastor Munoz. I mean, it took me, I have to gather courage to do that because I'm somebody that if I want to do something, either I do it or I don't. If I'm in for God, it's got to be 100%. If not for God, they got to be for God and with my whole heart. So I was looking for the little, little stuff that I was having doubt. So I met Pastor Munoz and I told him concerning the situation. So he was um he was quite quite impressed, you know, for me to walk up and say that because many people will be so embarrassed. Me, I don't feel embarrassed when I know that I'm doing something that is wrong, which I want help and I want change because it's life, you know. We can get involved in stuff that you might think is normal, which is abnormal. So Pastor gave me consolation that is possible for me to get out of it. So I started, I mean, I have the desire, like, let me watch it, you know, like a movie, because that's something that we did for fun. So I started, like, anytime my mind want to go toward that direction, I said, no, that is sin. So I will hold myself. It was a battle. It was a struggle. Not up to last year, 2020, when freedom took place, you know, the battle that was happening in the world. By God's grace, I said pornography is the least of my problem because the world is in chaos. And if I don't keep myself straight, I might lose it. So that's when I took it upon myself and asked God, please free me from the desire. Cleanse me from this unrighteousness. Please do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. I was doing it like for fun. I didn't know that it's going to get to me. Let me have the normal desire from you. And God heals me from that. Mm. I said, I'm going to walk by faith. And God truly heals me. Mm. Amen. Thank you for sharing that so much, uh, Helen. Uh, what a blessing to be, able to, to be able to know that we are forgiven, completely forgiven by God, loved and fully accepted by God. And then when we feel safe, we can share We can share just like you've done here. And that just gives a power uh, for you're fully accepted and fully loved by, 
by God and by God's people. Very good. Uh, so let's see how we're doing with time. Oh, we're doing we're doing fine with time. Uh, Brother Thomas, did you want to share on this question too? Oh uh, yes. You know, we look at the Word of God and we see that if we confess our sins, it said He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's First John one nine. So we have to accept by faith that God has forgiven us. We don't have to walk around with a guilty conscience and and worrying about whether or not the Lord has forgiven us because his word said he would do it. And we just have to accept that by faith. Now, the Bible also said that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. So in other words, in order to increase your faith, you have to get in the word of God and you have to accept his promises, you know, and a lot of times we don't, we don't take the time to read the word and, and to accept these promises by faith. And also, if you regard iniquity in your heart, he said he won't hear you. So your, your, your prayers are futile. And, and if you don't, if you're thinking about doing sin and you got sin in your life, you know, so it's the Holy Spirit that leads us to repentance. So we mm -hmm. don't have it on our own. So mm -hmm. I, I accept the Lord, you know, and I accept his promises. And I know I've been out there like the prodigal son and I've done everything under the sun. And I know that Lord has forgiven me because I repented and confessed those sins. So that's where you got to do it. <laughs> oh, amen. That's powerful, powerful. We're seeing comments and comments pouring in here and people saying, amen, Sister Helene. Only God can break down strongholds in Jesus' names. And God truly, truly does. Another comment here from Kemutu Achira. Amen, amen. Incredible testimony, Sister Helen. Praise the Lord for His delivering power. Amen. Brother Thomas, says Sister Hammond there in, uh, in YouTube. All right, very good. Uh, praise the Lord. This is, this is just so wonderful. Um, all right, so next we're going to move to uh, keep it in the theme of that. You see the restoration. So there's this trouble. People have turned away from God. Here's how you turned away from God. And now here's how you come back to forgiveness. And because we're giving an opportunity to choose, an opportunity to choose. And so there's the scripture, Isaiah 1 and verse 19. And let's see, Helen, do you want to read it for us? Sure, Pastor. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Hmm. Amen. <laughs> uh, so God is not going to force us. Mm -hmm. um, God gives us the opportunity to choose. And, uh, and when we decide, yes, uh, God brings a solution. And the choice is ours. Uh, another passage that deals with that is in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. No matter how much we've sinned or how far uh, we are from God, God's grace has no limits. God always has the willingness to forgive us and to bring us back. And uh, now, God always has that willingness. But isn't it true that sometimes we don't have that willingness? So yeah. I have a question for everybody. And I'd love to hear your, your answers in the chat if you care to share. When you have no willingness, let me put it on the screen there for you. When you have no willingness to do the next right thing, the opposite might be the truth. But the truth, you know, what I want to do is what God doesn't want for me. So when you have, when you have no willingness to do, to do the next right thing, what has been most helpful to you in regaining your sanity? Um, and Brother Thomas, we'll go with you first on this. Well, uh, I noticed when I was out there in the world, you know, I was really thinking about the scriptures because I remember in Sabbath school when I was a little boy, we had to have the 13th Sabbath and you had to get up front and quote all 13 uh, memory verses for the, for the whole quarter. And mm -hmm. while, when I was a teenager and was backsliding, those verses came back to my mind <laughs> and, and it, it would keep you from doing certain things, you know, because it said that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So, you know, and, and then he sing those songs, you know, those hymns that we used to sing in the Adventist church. 
you sing those songs in your head and you drive the devil away. <laughs> no, because Paul said you got to sing songs and hymns and spiritual hymns, you know, and those things will bring you back to your sanity because sin is willful sinning is really insanity. <laughs> and so you have to really be serving the Lord to get your saneness back. Mm. So you're saying if, uh, so when you have no willingness to do that, to do the next right thing, those scriptures, the songs came back to you. I can definitely relate to that very much so, very much. Helen, what what, what about you? What, what, what yeah. brings you back to God? The Word of God. The Word of God have done me good. And it only happened when I got converted 2016 because I moved from Catholic faith on Sunday worship. That was true all my life. Then to start keeping the Sabbath. I mean, I've always been a Christian, believing in God 100%. But I didn't know that there's another personal relationship with God that only can come from you, not what the preachers say. So being having Bible studies before getting baptized, when I got converted, I did the amazing fact from 1 to all the way to 27. So it gave me a broader picture that there is more in Christianity, not only by saying it, by the word of God. So the word of God brought me hope. It gave me wisdom, wisdom that I've been, I've been asking for the whole through my life. The word of God have provided wisdom to me until I can support somebody through my words, can encourage somebody through my word. It got to be God. At first, I acknowledge my weaknesses. You know, Lord, I don't know. I don't know how to go about it. I want to start the journey with you. So take, you know, take me through. So God, you know, he did it through his word. You know, so when I read Ecclesiastes 1, that says vanity is vanity or is vanity. So I learned that we are just stranger on this earth regarding of what we are fighting or striving for. It got to be God and the word of God alone. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's look at a couple of comments that uh, came in here in, you, uh, in, uh, in the, the chats and YouTube and Facebook. Um, and I'll, re I'll read this one. Amen. When I said this prayer, let sin be as repulsive to me as it is to you. Um, and my eyes were open to uh, my every minute, or minute rather, wicked, sinful, self-centered ways. So praying. Let sin be as repulsive to me as it is from you. That was uh, Gillian who shared that. Praise God. And uh, let's uh, read one more comment here. God is a gentleman. Uh, God does not barge into our lives. God waits for us to ask for help. Thank you so much. Praise God for this uh, wonderful, wonderful comments. All right, we're getting close here to the end of our conversation. Uh, and so we have one more, one more section to go um, to talk about, and that is this concept of a point of no return. Let's take a look at it here. Uh, we're jumping now from chapter one in Isaiah to chapter five for this for this uh, study. And uh, let's see, Brother Thomas, would you read it for us right there, Isaiah five five? Okay. And now, please let me tell you what I would do to my vineyard. I will take away his hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down his wall, and it shall be trampled down. Hmm. Wow, that's quite a scripture. Now, if you have your Bible open there where you are, or uh, at least listen, verse 4, God says, What more could have been done to my vineyard? When he says vineyard, he's talking about the people, about you and me. What more could have been done to my vineyard? that I have not done for it? It's a question. God is pleading here. God's forgiveness is boundless, but we might reject it to a point of no return. This is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. There's also a section about it in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. It is ex extremely hard to get to the point of no return. In other words, not being able to hear the plea of the Holy Spirit. It's extremely difficult. Um, and yet, some people have reached that point. 
Uh, now, God's patience is relentless. His call is unceasing. God will do everything possible to persuade us to accept God's grace before we reach that point. I'm so grateful for that. Our souls can be laid waste, as it says in verse 6, uh, here in Isaiah 5, only if we stubbornly decide not to listen to God. And so, I'm going to look uh, here again at Isaiah uh, chapter 5 and verse 7. It says, I'm going to read here a little bit, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. And then the rest of verse 7 says this, uh, Helen, would you read it for us though on the screen? This is God now. He says, you are my plant, you are my, my vineyard, and now what? He looked for justice, but behold oppressions, for righteousness, but be, behold a cry for help. This theme is repeated over and over again. What is it that God is looking for? Um, God is looking, he says, I was looking for beautiful fruit, beautiful grape, but I found wild grapes, sour grapes, not good. What is that? Oppression. What is that? A cry for help. That's not being answered. So, I have a question for everybody as we close. Why does God care so much about people in need? Helen, what do you think? Praise the Lord. Uh, I will start with um with the scripture, John 15, verse 15. I'm going to paraphrase. That says, God calls me and God calls you and all of us friend, not servant. Because he said the servant doesn't see the face of the master. But being that he calls us friends, you know, we can chat with him. We can talk with him. And whatever that our Lord Jesus, you know, have from the Father, we're going to have it through him. So in all, I can conclude that God's love us so much that he doesn't want us to suffer. Because if he leaves us alone with our weak self, and light-minded, we're going to go astray and commit sin and wish the wages of sin is death. No father wanted, you know, the child or the children to die. So because of that, he sent, you know, his only begotten son to die for us because of the love he has for us. And being that we are human, just like how our Lord experienced it, that came in a human form, he pleaded for Holy Spirit which is going to be our comfort and strength and our director that will redirect our mind to him. That's how much he loved us, you know, to help us because we need that to make it to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much. Brother Thomas, your final comments on this question. Yes, uh, we have to feel a need for Christ. And once he know that we have a need for him, then he will be there for us. But he draws us to him. You know, it is the Lord who draws us to him by his love and his kindness. And the thing is, when people get self-sufficient, they get a lot of money. They feel they got a good job, education. They don't feel they have a need for Christ. And that's a sad thing because Jesus said it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not impossible. He just said it's hard. <laughs> and that's the thing about it. We have to be careful how we try to get so self-sufficient that we don't need the Lord. Hmm. All right. And um, as we look at Isaiah and his burden for people in need and his call for the people of God to be helpful, uh, when we do have means, as you alluded there, uh, Brother Thomas, um, and God allows us to have means so that we can look at those who have nothing, who are oppressed. Um, and if there's a cry for help, you want to be in a position where, where you don't have to wonder if you're able to help. Um, having, a, having a fund within your budget, a, a sign for helping someone that comes, that comes across in need, is definitely a godly thing to do. All right. That's because we are children of God. We, we are blessed. We are blessed. Uh, let's um, put one more comment here. We have time. Uh, from Michelle Hardy, she wrote, Because his compassion knows no bounds, he pities us and wants us to reach down in the mud, wash us off, and assure us 
that we can make it and that we can help others make it too, right? I love God. I love God too. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Time has expired. We, uh, wow, I can't believe this. Uh, but it's going to be a really fun time. Uh, Helen, uh, time is already up, but can you uh, just uh, pray briefly, just a short prayer of gratitude to God now? Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, King of all glory, we thank you for your endless love and mercy and compassion. Lord, we thank you for crossing us over to this new year, 2021. Father, we pray for abundance of faith in you that will bring us closer to you and feel the everlasting comfort that will give us the strength and move forward till you come again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, everybody, amen. God bless you again. Happy New Year. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we'll see you again, uh, if not sooner, we'll see you again right here next Sabbath. And uh, take care. We have to go now. We uh, begin the uh, other service in just, uh, just a few minutes. Uh, if you're watching on the computer, you might have to refresh. Uh, we'll start uh, right on time at 11, even before, um, with a countdown. So God bless you, everyone. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.